Good morning, I'm Steve Morgan. I'm a retired landscape architect, naturalist, and Chautauquan performer as Alda Leopold. We're here to celebrate the centennial of the Gila Wilderness, which Aldo Leopold was very influential in making happen. The Gila Wilderness is our first national wilderness and actually first wilderness area in the world designated that way. This is part of a series called Starting Conversations that's sponsored by the New Mexico Humanities Council. So if we can begin, follow me inside. Good morning. My name's Aldo Leopold. Welcome to the Pitchfork Ranch. Hello, my name is Dan Schilling. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and I have been studying and researching and thinking a lot about our guest today for a long time. So I want to welcome Aldo Leopold. Thank you. And I'm an East Coast person. I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, and I came to the Southwest in 1979 thinking I would get my degree and move on. And like a lot of people, I fell in love with the Southwest, I fell in love with the people, I fell in love with the geography, I fell in love with the landscape. And I think when I read Leopold that I see a lot of that same evolution and transition in that man who came out here from the East. So Aldo, welcome. I want to ask you from the, in the beginning you arrived in Springerville, Arizona, which I know quite well, in 1909. Could you tell us something about the environments that you stepped into, both the natural environment, what was going on with the land at the time, and the cultural environment? What, what, was, the social, what was the society like? What was the place like that when you arrived here in 1909? In 1909, I left Albuquerque, took a train to Holbrook, Arizona Territory, and from there, it was a two-day stagecoach ride on a dusty road due south to the little town of Springerville, which is where the Apache National Forest was headquartered. That little road was the only road in that whole area. All of our projects, everything that we worked on, we did on either horseback or on foot. There were no vehicles. And so it was very wild, very remote, very few people. The people that were around there, Springerville was a Mormon community. But most of the people in the outlying areas were either Hispanic or indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. the, the communities were separate. The residents in Springerville um, did not interact very much with the people outside. That, and many of them have been there for hundreds of years and their families. But the land around there was very wild and still was in 1909. Yeah, you might be surprised to know that 
today Arizona has millions and millions of people living in it. In fact, I live in a city called Phoenix that has about five million people living in it. Phoenix has five million Or, or more, uh, what they call the Valley of the Sun. I know you went there a few times. You went down to Tucson a few mm -hmm. times. But when you arrived in Arizona, there were about 200,000 people living in the entire state. And next door in New Mexico, there were a few more. New Mexico was a bigger community. It's worthwhile sometimes to think back about the community that you stepped into, that how few people live there. And most of the people that you looked at outside of Springerville when you were out doing your researching on the lands, uh, most of the faces, and you talk about this in one essay where you say, most of the faces I looked at were brown. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you specifically that uh, many of the places that you lived in and worked in bordered on Native American reservations. In fact, if you look at where you lived, you know, in Springerville, you of course have those uh, Apache reservations nearby. And then when you went over to New Mexico, you had all the Pueblo reservations nearby. I wanted to ask you, what did you think about indigenous nations when you moved out here? Did you know much about them? And then how did your understanding of, of indigenous society and indigenous land ethics. How did that change over the 15 years that you spent here and maybe beyond after you went to Wisconsin? I think when I, when I first arrived, I was rather enamored with the mystery of being in the Wild West, um, a chance of being a cowboy, mm -hmm. um, a chance of actually being around some of the Indians that you know, we had read so many stories about. When I started working out there, that rather paled because we were working and we were pretty much by ourselves most of the time. There were probably more bears and mountain lions than there were people that we dealt with on a daily basis. Early on, I do remember thinking we had a job to do and that a lot of the peoples, they weren't happy that we were there that we were telling them what they could do with land that they had done for, you know, it had been part of their living uh, for centuries, if not longer. And so we had problems. And at that time, that was my job. And so they were more of a hindrance, really, in, in what we were trying to do. But the more that I worked with them, the more I was exposed to the reality that this was their land. This had been their land. Little by little, I found myself thinking a little differently. Part of it, I think, was having respect for who they were, for their culture. Because at that time, who we were, I was from Iowa. So many of the people that I worked with were from back east. We didn't honor their cultures. We didn't really see them much different than, say, the predators that we were trying to shoot. And, and we thought it was improving the landscape. It was only after being out in the Southwest for years that I started seeing the value of what those cultures had. They had been developing in this area for so many years. We were newcomers. Mm -hmm trying to impose our ways upon them. Over time, I feel like I did start respecting what they mm -hmm. had to say. Mm -hmm. But in order to respect what someone has to say, you have to listen. And we weren't listening very well. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that just came with time, is paying more attention to the impact, the positive impacts that they had on what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. After you had worked in Albuquerque at the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is an interesting, <laughs> you know. It, it wasn't a job I ever thought I would Yeah, have. it was an interesting career choice. But after you left the Chamber of Commerce, and Chamber of Commerce is deal a lot with tourism, mm -hmm. and especially in the Southwest at the time, you had Fred Harvey bringing people out here to go to the Grand Canyon, go to Hopi to experience the snake dance, et cetera. Uh, and he had all of his hotels in Leopold country, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the Northeast Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and you write after, this is after you've left, you say, 
a booster editor commenting on the situations coolly pointed out that the tourists getting value of the Indians depended on, depended on their distinctive culture, which should therefore be preserved. Uh, and I don't know if you know that that's a kind of tourism that you were promoting in 1918, I think it was when you wrote this or something, or 19... It was earlier than that, I think. And you're basically saying there that if we're, if we're focusing on tourism to grow the economy of the Southwest, what we need to do is build on those attributes that make us distinctive. Mm -hmm. And that could be Indian cultures, Hispanic cultures, and that could be architecture, for instance. Could you say a little bit about that? The reason I took that position and left the Forest Service, and it was 1918, we had no foresters, we had no people to work our projects, and our budget at that time was getting cut more and more. I had three young children, and I had to provide a living, so the opportunity to be Secretary of the Chamber of Commerce in Albuquerque came up and it was not my ideal job, but I needed a job. I felt that every opportunity I had to work at something was an opportunity to improve. It was an opportunity for me to grow, to learn more about things. And that one year in Albuquerque provided some new things to me that I had not experienced before. And, but one of the things that I really saw that I felt strongly about, there was a large influx of money coming from the East Coast to develop Albuquerque, but they wanted to build Albuquerque to look like an East Coast city. I married Estella in 1912. She came from a very, um, a family that had been very well established for a long time. And so those traditions of her family were there very strongly. And I felt that Albuquerque needed to reflect where we were. We were not on the East Coast. And so the Hispanic architecture and the indigenous people's architecture, uh, they, it was all around us. And we needed to reflect that and to give respect to, to those people. That was something I felt very strongly mm -hmm. about. Could we talk a little bit more about Estella? Uh, Gladly. Yeah. <laughs> Again, you're a, a, a man of Germanic stock who ends up in, in the Southwest and marries into a pretty successful Hispanic family, Mexican-American family. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what it was like entering into that cultural mix, you know, from the outside, whether it's the language or the religion or the fact that your father-in-law was a sheep rancher? <laughs> <laughs> I had a few conversations early on about that. I tend not to be one who angers quickly, but that was something that I, I do remember one time saying, Unless you want your block knocked off, leave that topic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, it was a challenge to not become involved sometimes because so many of the policies that we were trying to implement with the Forest Service, like overgrazing, and I had to deal with that with my family. Mm -hmm. You know, my father taught me in a quiet manner to accomplish things in a quiet way. You do the deed, and the deed will speak for itself. I felt the same type of thing with my family, with Estella's family, was by setting example. I knew if I went face to face that I wouldn't accomplish anything, but if I quietly talked about some of the policies that we had, some of the programs that we were doing, and some of the impacts that I was seeing other families of, of sheep herders, of what they were causing on our lands, that I might possibly change their way of thinking in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I did, but you don't do that by going head to head. You do that by example.
-hmm. And that's what I was trying to do. They had been there for a long time. And so many of their ways of life were well established. They were traditional. We were intruders. You can't come in and just impose, you know, new rules, which is what we attempted to do. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And so if you go about it quietly, it takes longer. But I think the results tend to be better because then you're compromising with both sides. Mm -hmm. In the Southwest at the time, we're talking about the early 20th century, you're there from 1909 to 1924 when you leave for Wisconsin. It's a period of real turmoil in Native American relations. Mm -hmm. uh, the reservations are terrible places. They constantly are going in and out of uh, you know, government policy that either wants to exterminate them or assimilate them or, or whatever. So, I mean, it, it, reservations at the time were one of the worst places. Well, the children were being sent to the schools. The children were going schools, to Indian separate schools, from families. et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and then we have a, a lot of turmoil with, you know, tribes being displaced and replaced. And, uh, and Leopold's living in the middle of all that, you yes. know, all this uh, Native American turmoil is, you know, is happening around him. And, and some people say, and I'm one, who say that your land ethic, the way it's couched, is little more than a indigenous expression of our relationship to land. Do you see that? Or did you ever intend that? Or do you just think that where you ended up is pretty much in an indigenous place. It's interesting that you say that because I don't recall ever really being conscious mm -hmm. of thinking that way. I've always tried to be observant. I've always tried to really look at where I am and why things are the way they are. And what I was seeing in my early part of my career, all the way until I left New Mexico in 1924, I saw the federal agencies imposing policies on these lands and on the people that had lived on those lands that were, they were homelands. Even the Spanish families, had many of them had been there for hundreds of years with the land grants. We were not paying any attention to their traditions. And a lot of those traditions were based on lessons that they had learned from being on the land for so long. And so we really had things to learn from them, but we weren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. The things that I picked up from seeing how they were, they were treating the land, there were places where people had been living on the land for a thousand years and more. They knew how to dry farm. They knew how to work with the land without damaging the mm -hmm. land. We didn't pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. And hence, we caused a lot of problems. We had a lot of erosion problems, overgrazing from our cattle. A lot of the, well, the earlier peoples, I mean, they didn't have the livestock. They didn't, you know, live hard on the land and then move on, you know, a few years later because it failed. You know, they learned how to work with the land. And so it was those lessons that I, I found myself realizing, like, this is what we should be doing, and this is the way we should be thinking about the land. So I don't think it was truly a conscious mm -hmm. effort. I never, I don't recall ever thinking that this is the way the indigenous peoples were, were thinking about things, and so we should be doing that too, but it made sense. It seems it like worked. you see the connections between indigenous people and the community of land, like that they're part of the land, they're not they don't control it. They're not conquerors of the land. They were community. Yeah. And, and, and that's something I know I've written about with when we're... A lot of our culture tends to think of things as a commodity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. How can I make the most buck out of it? Mm -hmm. and, and that's not the indigenous mm -hmm. way. Yeah. And, and that was one thing that I really realized early on and became more obvious as I got older and more ex experiences was how, how wrong our way of thinking was and how harmful it was 
-hmm. to the community, to the land. It seems after you moved to Wisconsin that uh, you're, you're stepping into a very different environment, yes. certainly in terms of indigeneity, because you make the comment when you arrive in Wisconsin that they have gotten rid of all the natives up there. That includes both the native forests and the native people. And so you sort of put those two together, that the, that, that, that the people are really... It's the community. It, they're they're, they're the central community. To, this, to the natural community as well as the cultural community. And then you make a... You go to Germany in 1935, and then, you, and then the Dust Bowl is going on. So in the middle of the 30s, there's all this ecological catastrophe going on. You're thinking about the Dust Bowl, where in a space of a few years, we've destroyed you know, a lot of the breadbasket. And you reflect on your time in the Southwest, where they were growing corn at Hopi on a rock, without water, for hundreds of years, without destroying the place. And it seems to me that you start to, in the mid-30s, you start to put together the idea of indigeneity with what, where you're going with your philosophy. Because you, you, you reflect back on your time in the Southwest and you saw how it was there. And you, know, you find yourself in Germany, you find yourself doing all that research in the Midwest where there's lots of, lots of problems. And, you, and of course, in Wisconsin, and just reflecting back on another time earlier when you saw how nature really could live with people. It's interesting hearing your perspective <laughs> of my writings from decades after I'm gone. You know, I've kept a journal since I was nine or 10, and it's those stories that I refer back to. And I know in the 30s, um, and 40s, when I was a professor at University of Wisconsin, I had more time to look back at my, my memories, the things that I wrote down. And that's one of the benefits of being older, is the experiences that you've accumulated, and you have a chance to see patterns. Mm -hmm. When you're young, and I've been told I was somewhat cocky, <laughs> somewhat of a know-it-all, but I learned quickly because you had to change if I was going to succeed. But it's looking back and seeing that we didn't know enough about what we were trying to do to do a good job. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole policy that we had with, with predators particularly, but also with overgrazing. Um, that was a major one that pretty much has stayed with me my whole life that is fascinated me, but also um, disturbed me greatly because we've lost so much of our soils. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that happened in the Dust Bowl was, you know, yes, the, the Hopi had done dry farming for thousands of years and successfully but they did it in small scale. They worked with the land form, whereas our ag agricultural practices tend to impose, you know, if the, the percentage of, of, of wheat that's coming out of a piece of land is dropping, we put fertilizer on it. We try to enhance it, instead of trying to actually improve the soils or change how we go about something. And that's, that's folly. Mm -hmm. That's not working with the land. That's imposing your will on something. And that's bound to break. So that observation, when I went to Germany, and what I really witnessed there was what I thought of as industrialized forestry. Mm -hmm. It was very mechanical. It was very thought out. And there was no diversity. There was no none of these natural layers that are so vital to harmony in the natural world. They had removed that. They didn't pay enough attention to that. They didn't think it had any worth. Well, a year later, in 1936, I made my first trip below the border down to the Rio Gavilan. And that contrast between Germany just a year previous to mm -hmm. seeing what I was seeing on the Rio Gavilan 
I mean, I was seeing a land that was in its, on the most part, an aboriginal state. It had not been altered. It was like visiting some of the Hopi lands where what it looked like when I saw it to what it looked like a thousand years ago wouldn't have been that much different because mm -hmm. they worked with the land. And the Rio Gavilan, you know, there were no cows. There was no fire control. There was no predator control. There were no roads. There was no managing. There was a harmony between forest and, and fire and, and predators and prey. It, there was a harmony there that mm -hmm. had been evolving for millennia. Mm -hmm. And we tend to ignore that. Do you know about the Iroquois Constitution? I, I'm familiar with it. I, I've read portions of it. Yeah. And it's, it's a fascinating document. Yeah, I think, you know, some people say that your land ethic simply reflects the same ideas that are embedded in that <laughs> your land ethic is much shorter. But it's, you know, it's a very long document. But the upshot of the Iroquois Constitution is the seven generations. You know, that we should think and plan and act with the land, thinking about seven generations to come. Now, you never use the phrase, as far as I know, seven generations, but it seems like you have a similar concept in your land ethic. Because you, you rarely use the word sustainability or whatever, but you do talk about, you just mentioned harmony and stability and permanence, I think, are very important mm -hmm. words Mm -hmm. in, in your in your thinking. Do you see the similarities there at all? I, I do. I Again, <laughs> I think when you look back through history, you some of those things become more obvious mm -hmm. than they were at the time. I, I'm an avid reader, uh, and I, I pretty much like to read any topic because I find things of interest, and I find things that when I read them, I, I, I like to write them down in my journals because when I refer back to them, they bring up some of these memories or they tie in with other things that I've been thinking. And so the uh, Iroquois Federation was one of those types of things. I mean, it was very forward thinking at that time period and very unlike what most of the white population in the United States gave the native people's credit for mm -hmm. that they were even capable of coming up with something like that and and to me that's the respect that was lacking that when you really read something like that if you didn't know who wrote it right you would have thought there was an incredible document and and that's the way we should look at it what i always am impressed with that document is how often it's basically their constitution compared to our constitution but how often words like nature and land and, and ground and soil show up in the Constitution that you should make your decisions under a tree. I mean, the whole Constitution and the whole Iroquois way of life is embedded in being a part of that land community. And it was combining many tribes yeah. that didn't always get along. Mm -hmm. So it was something very unique at that time. Mm -hmm. What is that thing you have in your hand? This? <laughs> you might like to know, Aldo, that this is called a phone. <laughs> uh, you I, had I'm telephones. I'm familiar with telephones. You had telephones. So this is what we use as a phone now. And also, I can use it to store information. Your book, Sand County Almanac, is on here, as well what? as all of your other essays. What's the name of my book? Oh, that's right. You didn't know the name of your book. <laughs> it's, they ended up calling it a Sand County Almanac. That was the decision of the publishers. You had was called this it Great Possessions. You had called it book? Great Possessions, and I, and then later on, your son Luna took to you know being I think the final editor on a lot of that with yeah. a, with a community they put together. He was a good boy. He was a good boy, and and he uh, it was actually the press I think Oxford University Press that suggested the title of a Sand County Almanac. So it came out a year after you died, soon went out of print. <laughs> mm -hmm. And but during the 60s, when there was somewhat of an environmental renaissance in the world, in the United States, and a lot of that renaissance was based in Native American and Indian cultures, too. In fact, one of the most famous posters they had was a picture of an Indian with a tear coming down 
his cheek because he was looking at a stream that was polluted. Uh, but so your book became one of the central, seminal studies, and, and still is to this day, you know, 50 years later, 60 years later. As, as an author, we can only hope I had no dreams that that would ever happen. But you intrigued me with some of the questions that you're asking me. I would like to know more about what has happened with the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. What are our relationships now with with them and also the Hispanic peoples mm -hmm. in, in, in the land? Well, I think there is an understanding, and you started this, uh, that the indigenous people knew something we did not. That they had lived here for thousands of years, as you said, did not mess the place up too bad. And some people say, well, that's because they didn't have the machines we had or that, you know, that sort or the of thing. Numbers. Yeah, or the numbers. And the, the fact is, they could have wiped out the buffalo had they wanted to. They could have destroyed their land had they wanted to. Uh, but I think it's almost impossible to do anything in southwestern land management today and not include the indigenous voice. We now recognize that that's a voice that probably was on to something we didn't know about for a long time and uh, that needs to be listened to. So I know at a college I used to teach at, Arizona State University, there are several programs over there that are about indigeneity and the humanities and the environment and ecology, et cetera. Uh, most of the courses now we call environmental humanities, where we would teach your book. Uh, also, my you, book's actually in college. Courses. Your your book is in a lot of college curricula, and not just not just Aldo in the environmental programs. It shows up in philosophy classes. It shows up in in uh, jurisprudence, in the law. You know. Uh, your book, especially your essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, is one of the most anthologized essays ever. Really? Ever. Um, so a, a lot of the programs at universities now and whatnot that are about the ecology, about the environment, about how do we live in this very fragile environment. I think you recognize that. It, it's on the one hand, it's extremely fragile. We can destroy it pretty easily, the desert. And we were. And we were. And on the other hand, it can be very hostile, you know, can, as you... Unless you knew how to live in it. Yes. Because yeah. that's one of the things that I remember being very thankful for was in 1912, 1913, I guess, an Apache, Hickoria Apache, mm -hmm. man saved my life. Yes. Yeah. Could you talk about that incident? I was the supervisor on the Carson National Forest, and there was a land dispute going on between some of the Hickoria Apaches and some of the local ranchers. And when we talk about how wild some of the land was, this was 1912. I had to take a train on my own forest. I had to take the train west and then get on a stagecoach and ride for almost a day and then horseback to finally get down to where the Hickorias in this dispute was. So it was not an easy route to get to this. And when I did, it took several days, but we resolved the problems. But I wasn't looking forward to the long ride back. And so I decided that I would ride horseback and I would get back and, and see some more of, of, of the forest. The first night out, I ran into a snowstorm and I was having some problems. Um, with my legs a little bit, and I wasn't sure what was going on with that. I just thought I was a little under the weather. And I ended up being caught out in the snowstorm, and I would have died then. But a Hickoria Apache found me and took me into shelter and put me up and kept me warm during the night. And that probably saved my life. But mm -hmm. the next day, when I was on the horse going back, I didn't know what was wrong, but my legs were swelling up. I had to slip my boots to actually get them on. And by the time I finally did get back to the ranger station, I felt like I was okay. And my assistant supervisor said, no, you're not. 
and sent me to Santa Fe and saved my life. But it was the hospitality mm -hmm. from that Hickory Apache man who truly saved my life, because I would have died that night. Mm -hmm. Where you were in Mexico was, was used land. I mean, it wasn't forest. I mean, the native people lived there. But they had a way of living with the land that you recognized was harmonious. It was. They worked with the land. Yeah. They, they did a lot of, in, in their farming, they, unless you were really looking for their impacts, mm -hmm. they were harder to see. They lived more small scale. They did a lot of terracing. They did a lot of, um, we called it niche farming, where they actually were using places in the landscape where they were planting where they could instead of leveling out an area and planting you know, huge mm -hmm. uh, amounts of crops, which was not sustainable. They couldn't keep it up. And so when you're doing the small scale, you can move around. And if you lose this patch, you still have three other patches that are fine. Whereas if you lose your whole field, you're in mm -hmm. trouble. And so it, it, it was a low impact, but very harmonious with the land. And they were part of the land. They lived with the land. You, you talk about you know, farming and agriculture and mention that, I mean, one of the key elements of your kind of agriculture is, is diversity. Mm -hmm. The word diversity comes up a lot. But you often connect diversity with stability. Like if you want to harmonize, if you want sustainability, it requires diversity. You can't do it with a monoculture, which is what we saw with the Dust Bowl. And Germany. And Germany, yes. yes. Are you familiar with the phrase, three sisters farming? No. Do you want, and I see that in your work as well, because, well, could, could you talk a little bit about what you would want a farmer, what you would want his farm to look like if he were growing acres of corn? What I would like to see for like a, a healthy yes, land? Yes, a healthy cornfield. What else what would be there? Knowing what crops work together. Yeah. Um, we tend to, our agriculture tends to focus on like one crop, whereas nature doesn't grow things that way. And so if you have knowledge of the relationships between, say like tomatoes and carrots, or you know, that there are other relationships like that, that if you're paying attention, you can see that if you have those two plants together, they do better mm -hmm. than if they're by themselves. What plants work well? What kind of soils? Some plants like certain types of soils. And so it's knowing those kinds of things. It, it doesn't lend itself to just doing huge fields of, say, wheat and corn. Yeah, the profit motive pushes them to do one culture. Which leads to soils that get depleted exactly. and eroded yeah. away. Well, the, the native people figured this out as well. <laughs> and they, they have a phrase called three sisters farming, which I think is very similar to what mm -hmm. you would have proposed to farmers. And the, the idea being that if you're growing corn, it grows better if you maybe have bean and squash with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, so much of this comes down to observing. Mm -hmm. Observing and paying attention and, and following up on what you learn. Yeah, and, and paying attention to what works in nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you are on to, is when you talk about the cogs and the wheels mm -hmm. and the intelligent tinkering, that every part is meaningful. Every part has a purpose. Because after billions of years of evolution, that's where nature ended up. And nature would not have ended up there had it not worked. And I think that's what you were trying to there, get There's back a to. reason for the cogs and the reason for the wheels. And when I say intelligent tinkering, that's just our way. We, we are going to tinker. We are going to try <laughs> to make it better or change it in some way. But if we don't understand a system and we start pulling cogs and wheels out, that's not intelligent tinkering. That's folly. Mm -hmm. Well, Aldo, this has been a pleasure. I've been reading 
you for a long time. You meant so much to me. And uh, I want to thank you for you know, giving us your words, giving us your wisdom. It's an honor to know that my endeavors have helped in some way. Mm -hmm. And I do think that where you ended up is where, as I said earlier, where a lot of indigenous nations ended up. After you think about it, after thousands of years of what you call intelligent tinkering, they figured out this is the way to live with the land. Mm -hmm. And I see that in your work as well, that after these four decades, your, I, I would call it your intellectual journey from being a 22-year-old guy ended up in you know, Springerville, Arizona, until you, you know, until 1948, there's been this sort of, sort of 40 year transition. And I would argue that a lot of that transition, a lot of your movement, a lot of your evolution as a thinker began in the Southwest. Uh, it did. Because for one thing, it was just so different. The land was different, the people were different. It was also a, a lot, you didn't have a whole lot of choice to not have experiences. Mm -hmm. Because if you were outside and working, you were going to have experiences. And if you were observant, you were going to benefit from those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's, that's what I did. I, there was so much to learn. Mm -hmm. and, and you did. And you passed it on. So thank you. Thank you.